My name is Joe Sharp. I'm a private detective. I typically get called when nobody else can get the job done. I don't come cheap, but I'm worth it. Usually. I was hired by a couple named George and Denise King. They have twin daughters in their early 20s named Sarah and Kara. Sarah and Kara were avid boaters and enjoyed taking vacations together in which they would take their bow rider boat down major rivers and spend their nights in river towns. They had recently taken such a vacation down the Ohio River. They would call their parents every night to let them know what town they were in. The last time the parents heard from their daughters was on a Saturday. The twins were staying the night at a bed and breakfast in Paducah, Kentucky. The next night, the twin girls did not check in with their parents. That was extremely unusual. Then, the following morning, Sarah and Kara were discovered wandering aimlessly on the side of a dirt road in a small town called Monkey's Eyebrow. The twins were lethargic and would not respond to anybody, including their parents. Sarah and Kara King now reside at the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital. Doctors have no explanation for the twins' listless state, other than to say they must have experienced some form of extreme trauma. I was hired by the Kings to find out exactly what happened to their twin daughters. I started at the bed and breakfast the twins had stayed in two days before they were found. It was a pleasant little place in downtown Paducah, which is a charming river town. The proprietors of the bed and breakfast described the twin girls as delightful and full of life. They checked in at approximately 7 o'clock p.m. on a Saturday night and left the next morning at 8 o'clock. There was no change in their demeanor during their entire stay there. Whatever traumatized the twins happened that Sunday, after they departed from Paducah. A quick scan of their credit card purchases showed the last place they used their card to be a restaurant called The Rusty Bucket, located in Monkey's Eyebrow, Kentucky, not too far from where the twins were found. I was anxious to see what I could find out there, but first, I wanted to pay a visit to Sarah and Kara to see exactly what kind of condition they were in. I spoke to the head of the hospital, Dr. Franklin Grimm. He explained that Sarah and Kara were thoroughly examined. There were no signs of injury, abuse, rape, or assault of any kind. Whatever transpired was a mystery. I was allowed to visit the twins. They sat in chairs positioned in front of windows that looked out over the hospital's parking lot. They both slowly rocked back and forth in their chairs. From a distance, one might get the impression that the twins were looking out the windows, but up close, I could see they were doing nothing of the sort. As I stood close and studied them, I could see their eyes were lifeless and staring off at nothing. I spoke to the girls as if there was nothing wrong with them. I explained that nobody understood why they were in their current condition. I told them I knew they were fine when they left Paducah, and I asked them directly what happened to them in Monkey's Eyebrow. I gave them ample time to respond, but there was no getting through to them. They were in a near vegetative state. The twin girls simply weren't there. Or so I thought. As I turned to walk away, I heard a whisper. I turned back and I could see Sarah's lips barely moving, but she was saying something. I got up close, put my ear next to her mouth, and listened. Phil Ethna Elusic. She kept whispering that phrase over and over. Filk, ethna, elusic. Then Kara started repeating the odd phrase in a louder whisper. They both kept repeating it over and over. It made no sense to me. 
It was either a language I hadn't heard before, or complete gibberish. I held my digital recorder close to their mouths and recorded them saying the words before I left. I needed to find out what that phrase meant. What were they saying? I knew an old retired gumshoe named Buddy Brown who was an expert in languages. He wasn't hard to find. I knew he liked to hang out at a sex fetish club called Club Fun. It was a strange place that all sorts of weirdos went to act out their secret sexual perversions. I had been to Club Fun several times before, not as a sexual deviant, but for information. So I wasn't shocked when I walked into the club and immediately saw a topless woman walk past me, leading a buck-naked man around on a dog leash. I turned the corner, stepped into a corridor, and stopped to see if Buddy Brown would happen by. The hallway was lit by a dim blue glow and a slow strobe light. There was a couple dressed up like clowns making out against the wall. Just down the hall from them I saw a man in a tuxedo pouring a bottle of champagne over a woman wearing a red latex bodysuit. Then I recognized a familiar face. It was a hooker in a platinum blonde wig and fishnet stockings. For ten bucks she was always happy to point me in the right direction. Have you seen Buddy Brown? The platinum-wigged hooker snatched the ten-dollar bill from my hand and crinkled up her nose in disgust as she said, He's in the Hall of Toilets. The Hall of Toilets was exactly that. A hallway full of functional toilets that folks with bathroom fetishes would use in front of each other. As I turned the corner and entered the Hall of Toilets, I immediately witnessed a man taking a leak right out in the open. Two pale, bikini-clad women were standing next to him, observing the act. Five or six toilets down sat Buddy Brown. He was wearing a tan fedora and a beige, short-sleeved collared shirt with dark brown stripes. His khaki pants were down around his ankles as he read a dime store novel. Hey, Buddy, you got a minute? Needless to say, he was surprised to see me. Joe, what brings you here? I got right to the point. I didn't want to spend a second longer at this freak show than I had to. I want you to listen to this recording and tell me if you recognize the language. I played the recording of the twins' gibberish. Buddy recognized the language instantly. Sure, it's English. English? I thought maybe I had misunderstood him, but he was nodding. They're saying something in reverse English. He took my digital recorder from my hand. Here, I'll play it backwards. He fidgeted with the settings for a moment and then played the recording of the twins' phrase in reverse. Their statement was now clear. Castle on the cliff. I had no problem finding the rusty bucket in Monkey's eyebrow. It was the only building in the tiny town. There was something odd about the people of Monkey's Eyebrow. They all seemed a bit nervous and edgy. I showed a picture of the twins to the cashier, who was an elderly woman. I remember them. Very nice girls. There was a storm rolling in. They asked if there was a place in town they could stay. Unfortunately, there is no lodging available in Monkey's Eyebrow. Do you know where they went? She shook her head. They mentioned having a boat at the river. I assume they went back in that direction. Down the dirt path. Have you ever heard of the castle on the cliff? The old woman's eyes widened and she stared at me a long moment before turning and walking away without saying another word. I was done wasting time. I addressed the twenty or so people in the restaurant. Has anyone ever heard of a place called the Castle on the Cliff? Suddenly the restaurant went silent and everyone turned their head and stared at me all at once. No one muttered a word. So is that a yes or a no? The people nearest me gave me one long last glare before getting up and leaving the restaurant. Another couple did the same. When the next person got up to follow suit, I held up a hand. I get the message. 
With that, I exited the rusty bucket. As I headed for my car, I halted when I heard a psst. I turned to see a lanky young man dressed in blue jeans and a light blue dress shirt. He had short hair that was neatly parted on the side. I hear you're asking about the castle on the cliff. I approached the young man. You know of it? If you ask around, people will tell you it doesn't exist. But it does. Something happens to people who enter the castle on the cliff. They never leave the same. Well, where is this place? How do I find it? He motioned to a break in a nearby forest. Down that dirt path. But you don't find it. It finds you. Well, what does that mean? Nobody can see the castle on the cliff unless there's a full moon accompanied by a storm. He looked up at the sun dipping under the horizon. There's a full moon tonight. His sentence was immediately followed by a loud crack of thunder. My advice is to leave immediately, but I can tell you're the kind of man who won't take such advice. So, good luck. I started down the dirt path into the thick brush of the forest. Within 20 minutes, the heavens opened up on me and I cursed myself for not being the kind of guy who uses an umbrella. I could hear the choppy waters of the nearby river over the storm and thought for a moment that the young man had been pulling my leg. But suddenly, under the illumination of a flash of lightning, I saw it. The castle on the cliff. It was a towering structure that appeared out of nowhere. It sat atop a thin bluff that looked as though it might buckle under the castle's weight. I followed the constant flicker of lighting from the relentless storm to inch my way toward the castle. It was a castle from a dream with large round towers. The windows within the towers were glowing orange with a warmth as if beckoning me. Suddenly, the soft, muddy ground in front of me transitioned into bricked walkway that led me to the entrance of the massive construction. The enormous double wooden entrance doors greeted me. I pushed them open and stepped into the sweeping foyer of the welcoming castle. The castle had indeed found me. This was no doubt the same experience the twins had on that cold, stormy night. They were simply taking refuge from the storm in the castle much like I was. But something terrible happened to them while they were within the walls of this place, and I intended to find out what. There was a massive stone staircase in the center of the foyer. It had to be 12 feet wide and curved out of sight. Perhaps the mystery of what happened to the twins could be uncovered if I followed the stairs. As I took a few steps toward the colossal stairwell, I noticed an elaborately framed mirror on the wall. The frame was a yard across on all sides and appeared to be some form of beech wood that had been carved into a twisting serpent. The mirror itself was so big that it nearly covered the entire wall. I halted in place when I stared into it because I didn't see my own reflection. I saw the reflection of others. Hundreds of others standing in rows upon rows. They all stared back at me with sadness pouring over their faces. I quickly looked over my shoulder and saw nobody. But when I peered back into the mirror, they were still there. Including the twin girls, Sarah and Kara. They were looking at me with lively, darting eyes. It was as if they were trying to warn me of something. It was then that my own reflection began to slowly manifest within the mirror. I could feel my body start to tremble and a weakness was beginning to come over me. As my reflection became clearer, my knees began to buckle and my hands began to shake. It was as though I was slowly dying as my reflection came to life. It was then that I realized that the castle on the cliff was sucking the life out of me. I knew if I didn't do something fast, I'd wind up in a vegetative state not unlike the twins. 
With my last ounce of strength, I withdrew my 38 revolver from my holster, aimed it at the monstrous mirror, and pulled the trigger. The shatter of the mirror was deafening as the shards of glass crashed to the ground. My ears rang as the castle let forth with a malevolent, hideous, anguished roar. This was followed by a blast of hot air that bowled me over and dropped me to the icy floor. I looked up at the mirror and witnessed hundreds of small, comet-like orbs breaking away from the mirror and zipping around the room wildly searching for a way out. I got to my feet, rushed to the heavy castle doors, shoved them open, and watched on as the spirits that the castle had trapped over many years escaped into the night. It took me a little while to regain my full strength. When I finally did and stepped out of the castle, the storm broke and the sun began to rise. As soon as I got to my car, I floored it to the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital. As I hurried into the hospital, I was met by the twins, Sarah and Kara. As I suspected, they had a miraculous recovery. They hugged me tight and cried tears of joy as they thanked me over and over again. I slept well that night. <laughs> Just another day on the job.